Welcome to another message from C3 Mumbai. For more information about C3 Mumbai, please visit our website c3mumbai.com or visit our Facebook page. All right. Okay, we're going to be talking about prayer today. Um, the reason I'm, I'm talking about prayer because I think there is a lot of there's a lot of conjecture about what prayer is. Uh, there's a lot of sort of, it's like, okay, so I know that it's good to pray. Anyone that has any sort of spiritual background knows that prayer should be there. But the Bible specifically has a way of praying that is completely different to anything that we may currently think about prayer or some traditions. The Bible talks about prayer in terms of relationship. And the Bible also talks about prayer in terms of a, to a God who loves us who is actually interested in us, who has mercy on us, who wants the best for us, who wants to walk with us and through us and in us. It totally changes things also when you begin to understand that prayer is not an exchange between two people who don't know each other or two people who aren't connected in any way, sense or form, but it's actually a prayer between a, a parent and a child. It's actually a conversation between a parent and a child. When we start to think about prayer, we're talking about God the Father communing with his child, you and I. It's a, it's a conversation. Now that changes things when you begin to think of prayer in terms of, I am talking to my dad. Who, 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 who thinks about that? That's not how prayer is normally presented, is it? No, normally prayer is presented in the sense of, you know, we need, to, we need to come in and be afraid and we need to come in and kind of, we're not sure what to do just in case we mess it up. But if you know something that this glorious God, who is holy, who is amazing, who is incredible, is actually your father, it changes the way. You can come in and, and sit in his presence and he accepts you as you are. He wants to change you, he wants to help you, but he accepts you as you are. I love my kids. I can't wait to see my children. I can't wait to see my beautiful wife, Rachel. <laughs> I can't, but I'm talking about my kids because I want to make a point. When my kids run up to me, they don't think about it. They don't think about it. They don't think, should I approach my dad? Um, you know, I'll either see them at the airport or at home, I don't mind where, but, you know, when they see me, I know one thing that they're going to do, they're going to run, okay? If they're a distance from me, they're going to run, and I'll get down on my knees, and I'll accept them. Now, no matter where, how they're clothed, even if they haven't had a shower for 10 days, which would be disgusting, <laughs> but even if, you know, they, they are just being really naughty with their mum and messing up, you know, and not doing the right thing and they've, they've been absolute terrors, whatever, I'm still going to accept those hugs because they're my kids. And, you know, it's the same with God and you. I mean, and it's different, you know. Elijah comes in and he'll try to squeeze me as hard as he can. He wants to show me how strong he is. He wants to show me his brute force and he's getting bigger, so he kind of starting to knock me a little bit, <laughs> you know. I love that. And Willow, she comes in, she just wants to be held. You know, and, and, and I'll, each, one of, each one of my children, both of them, I don't have many. <clears throat> I have two. Uh, they express their love in different ways, which I love. You know? And it's the same with you, because you're so, we're so often trying to get it right with prayer. But God knows how you express yourself to him. And he wants to bring that out of you. Some of us might sing. Some of us might sit and just be quiet and meditate. Some of us might write poetry. Some of us might draw. Some of us might need to go for a big, long walk and, and just enjoy the presence of God. Some of us might get up really, really, you know, early in the morning or what, whatever. I mean, that's good if you can do that. But whatever it is, God loves the way you pray. You know that? Because it's not because of any other reason except for that you're his kid and you're coming to him. And he's saying, come, 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 come. He's a merciful father. Amen? We need to relax about prayer. 
you know, religion presents prayer as this thing. You have to do it. You have to do it. Oh, you, you know, you got to, you got to, you got to, you got to. And yes, you do have to. Yes, there are benefits for praying to the, the Heavenly Father. There, there are, of course. But, but, but the moment you think it's religious and the moment it becomes this, this task, you've missed the point. And you're missing out on the relationship with the daddy. Daddy. Amen. One of the reasons we really need to pray my voice is so different than it normally is. I'm just, I'm listening to my voice going, wow, my voice is, I don't know if I like it. Sometimes it's kind of cool to have a croaky voice, you know. you like, you know, anybody else like that? They're like, hey, I've got kind of a croaky voice. They kind of sound cool. Anyway, I'm just enjoying it. But I'm looking forward to getting my voice back. But, but one of the things with prayer is this, is we need prayer because life is in a constant state of flux. Who knows that the moment you get used to something, it changes. <laughs> The moment you get comfortable in something, it's almost like it slips and it changes, right? Life is in a constant state of flux. One thing that is constant is this. Things are going to change, right? One thing that is constant is this. Things are going to change. Another thing that is constant is tax. Anyway, but we're not going to talk about that. (laughs) Excuse me. We're going to talk about a guy called Daniel. He has his own book in the Bible. Daniel is one of my favorite kind of, you know, one of the favorite records of, of one's life was one of the guys that was Daniel. What happened with Daniel is he was an Israelite, lived in Jerusalem, and Jerusalem got raided and overtaken by Babylon. There was a king, his name was King Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar, can you say that? Nebuchadnezzar, you don't have to. But his name has got two Zs in it, or two Zs in it. That's how big his name was, Nebuchadnezzar. What Daniel was, he was actually from quite a noble background. Okay, he was from a noble background or some sort of royal background. And what the king, what King Nebuchadnezzar did when he raided, he took all of the Israelites back to Babylon, and he got together some of the nobility and some of the royal family of 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 Jerusalem, and he put them in his house and began to train them in the ways of Babylon, the way, you know, how the courts worked, how how royalty worked, how diplomacy worked how all of the things and they became the wise men of Babylon why did he do that the king did that so that he could rule over the Israelites okay through these people kind of like what the British did with the Parsis I suppose probably I don't know if that's a correct uh, sort of thing but that's what they did that's what Nebuchadnezzar did So picture this, Daniel gets raided, loses his home, loses everything, gets forced to go into the service of a king he doesn't really like or know. But he, in all of that, keeps his faith and things begin to settle and things begin to get all right back in Babylon. But then what happens is King Nebuchadnezzar, or we can call him King Neb, he has a dream. He has this dream that terrifies him. It absolutely terrifies him. And uh, in this dream, he sees this big statue and it's made of different materials. And the king doesn't understand what this dream is about. So he gathers together all of his wise men. Like, and these guys were like mystics. Uh, these guys were like seers and uh, let me read it to you. 1 verse 17. Oh, sorry, it's uh, the next scripture on 2 verses 1 to 6. In the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His mind was troubled and he could not sleep. So the king summoned magicians, enchanters, sorcerers and astrologers to tell him what he had dreamed. It's amazing that we've still got these kind of people around and people still go to these kind of people. 
But they, they, he went to them to tell him what he had dreamed. Dreamed. When they came in and stood before the king, he said to them, Okay, I've had a dream that troubles me, and I want to know what it means. Then the astrologers answered the king, May the king live forever. Tell your servants a dream, and we will interpret it. The king replied to the astrologers, Okay, you guys, I'm going to give you a test. This is what I have firmly decided. Nebuchadnezzar is a little crazy. If you do not tell me what my dream was and interpret it, I will have you cut into pieces and your house is turned into piles of rubble. It's a nice guy. <laughs> but if you tell me the dream and explain it, you will receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. So tell me the dream and interpret it for me. <coughs> <laughs> Well, they couldn't. This is funny. Uh, there's this funny joke my dad used to tell. He used to tell this joke about a, a prophet's convention. You know what a prophet is, right? A person who can tell the future, and like a prophet, this kind of person, a prophet. But on a prophet's convention, they don't have to put the date or time. They just put, you know the place, you know the time. <laughs> <laughs> If you can't find the place, you're not a prophet, right? The king kind of does that. He's like, you guys, if you really have some sort of power, you should know what my dream is. You should know what I'm dreaming about here. You should know what my problems are. And if you don't, well, <laughs> I hope you like being, you know, separated. I'm going to cut you into little pieces. Like, wow, okay, imagine being one of those guys. Well, they go on and, and they try to plead with the king. The king gets angrier and angrier and angrier to the point where he, he, just, he just goes across the land. He said, you know what? I'm going to teach you all a lesson. All you wise men, all you people who know what you think you're talking about and all of that, I'm going to kill you all. So he sends out a decree because they're like, please tell us a dream and then we'll interpret it. He, he sends out a decree. And he says, everyone, anyone in, a, in my court who is a wise man is going to get killed. They're going to get wiped out. He's angry. He's having a bad day, old Nebuchadnezzar, Right? Now, one of those wise men was Daniel. So, so a, a, a messenger goes to Daniel's house. And just picture Daniel. He's already in a pretty bad situation. He's already been uprooted from his life. He's already in the service of this king. But at least things have settled down. And next thing, this, this person's knocking on his door and said, uh, please appear before the king tomorrow. He's going to kill you. <laughs> okay it's a bit of a bad situation right anybody know what I'm saying it's a pretty bad situation so what do they do I think I wrote down the wrong scripture I meant to write down Daniel chapter 2 verse 16 to 18 but I wrote down Daniel chapter 1 verse 16 to 18 So what does Daniel do? In verse chapter 2, verse 16, it says, At this, Daniel went to the king and asked for time so that he might interpret the dream for him. So he finds out, okay, what is it that we have to do? Okay, we've got to tell the king. So he goes and asks for time. Then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Azariah. He urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men in Babylon. During the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. What was Daniel's first port of coil in this stressful and terrible and horrible and life-threatening situation? What was the first thing he did? He called a prayer meeting with his buddies. That's what he does. He gets together with his boys, his peeps, and he starts to pray. They have an all-night prayer meeting. My question is this, and I ask this question with humility because I know that for me, the answer to this question is not what I would like it to be. But my question is this, is when you face trials 
that are as large as this, or even not as large as this, just trials that stress you out, what is your first port of call? Is this what you would do? Would you get together with your friends and pray? I wouldn't. I'd be stressed out first. But can you see, Daniel has this calmness about him. He has this kind of, okay, I'm walking into this. He goes and sees the king. He has this ability to walk through. I mean, this is the king who was, I mean, the most powerful king in the world at that point in time. The only person that was able to knock him out was the next king who was the king of Persia, a guy called King Cyrus. He knocked out this king. This was one scary guy. And here you see Daniel being able to go up. He goes and says, okay, guys, we need to pray. We need to pray. We need to get before the Lord and plead for mercy. That's all he does. I mean, he doesn't go and plead. He doesn't run away. He doesn't try to manipulate. <laughs> he just has a simple old prayer meeting. A simple old prayer meeting with his buddies. This is one of the things I just love about church. This is one of the things. That in church, you've got a crew of people who are going to stand next to you and pray with you. This is why we do Connect Group. This is why we do what we do. This is why we meet together every Sunday. Because, you know, we need each other in times where things are challenged. And the truth is, they will happen, those things, right? They will happen. When, when, when trials come, for me, I know that what I want to do is something tangible, something that at least gives me some sort of sense of control. But Daniel, he just goes and pleads to the Lord for mercy. He just goes and has a prayer meeting. Prayer is how we do life. Prayer is not a, is not a add-on. It's not a kind of just something that we have an option to do. And sometimes I think we do treat it like that. Sometimes we, we treat it more like, okay, I've tried everything, now I'm going to pray. You understand? Daniel doesn't do that. Daniel asks for time so that he can have a prayer meeting. It's the first thing he does. Right? This is saying something about the nature of prayer and the power of prayer. And I, I'm talking from experience. I know that I would just go, I would do everything I can before prayer. And when everything else has fallen down, I'm like, okay, you know what? We've got to pray. But Daniel's principle is to pray first. Pray first. That's the power of prayer. That's the power of the God we serve. He comes first. And we've got to put him first in every situation. He's got to put him first even in our trials even in our troubles. The thing about Jesus, when we think about Jesus, if I can just think about him for a moment and put Daniel on the side, is Jesus, in the three years of his ministry, was in a constant state of change. I mean, he didn't even have a home. He, he kept things so flexible and changeable that he would go from town to town. He wouldn't even lodge in a hotel. He would just go and sleep outside on rocks. And I mean, he was crazy. I mean, Jesus was amazing the way he went about and did his ministry. He was completely like cut loose from everything that could tie him down. And he was prepared for that. And you can see as you read the Gospels, what, what happens to him in three years happens like so quickly and so randomly like it's like more happened to him in those three years than what normally happens in a normal person's life i mean he constantly going here healing that person going from town to town doing everything and demons are fleeing and the sick are getting healed and and he's got trouble he's got people from day one who wanted to wipe him out they're like he's constantly having to hide and go through crowds 
to get away from the people who were trying to kill him because he was coming with a different message. He was coming from, with a message that wasn't religion. He was coming with a message that was about relationship with him. And those, in, those religious people, they just hated him because it was messing up with their system. It was messing up with the way they'd done everything forever. And, and they're like trying to kill Jesus. His whole life was in a constant state of flux. He never, he actually said, the, you know, foxes have holes, you know. And I can't remember the second, my, it, birds have nests, sorry, excuse me, yes. Yeah, but the Son of Man has nowhere to rest. It's like, I have nowhere to rest. I got nowhere to go right now. And that was, he was saying that in response to someone who wanted to follow him. What was it that got Jesus through all of that? Why did, he, why did he do that? He didn't have to do that. He didn't have to do any of that. But he was modeling something to us. He was showing us how to go through life, how to go through constant fluxes and constant changes, constant stuff that never goes right. He was showing us. It's in Luke chapter 5, verse 16. <coughs> it's one of the longest scriptures in, 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 in the Bible. This is how he did it. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. He was a man of prayer. Our God came and did what he did, not because he had to, but to model it. He came to rescue us. He came to die on the cross. He came to save us from sin. He came to be the perfect sacrifice and that pleased God so that we could walk into eternity with him, so that we could be filled with the Holy Spirit when we, receive, when we receive him. How did he do all of that? How did he do that? How did he make it all happen? He prayed. He prayed. And, and as you read the Gospels, you'll see it. The, the authors of the Gospels, the different, the different authors of the four different Gospels, well, it's there. Jesus withdrew. They're putting it in there for you to see that this was the source of power for Jesus. Prayer. 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 How do you go through change? How do you go through a constant state of flux? Prayer first. Prayer first. Put Him first. Put God first. And you'll find that as you're walking through life and the change that life brings, that you'll be able to do it. Even Paul Paul was put in jail, to jail, to jail, to jail. He was put everywhere he went. He got thrown into jail because, once again, the message he brought was a message that was so revolutionary. You've got to understand that this, this Bible, you know, that, that we are so privileged to have, people died for it. There's been thousands of people that have... That have this, this book has blood all over it that people have paid their lives for you to have. And... You know, one of those people was Paul. Um, and, and there's many people after him. But this is how Paul, this was a powerhouse for Paul. Have you got that scripture? 1 Corinthians 5 verse 17. Oh, 1 Thales Thessalonians, excuse me. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 17. <coughs> Let me just, I forgot to tag my Bible up. Let me know if it comes up. This up? Okay. What's it say? Pray continually. Is there any more to that, Siraj? No, there's nothing more. Pray continually. If, if you ever want to memorize scripture, this might be a good one to start with. <laughs> Yeah, I'm memorizing scripture, Ryan. Which one? Pray continually. There's another one in the, in the Gospels where it says Jesus wept. That's another good one. Jesus wept. <coughs> Pray continually. What was the powerhouse for Paul? Paul spent most of his ministry. Could you imagine starting a ministry? Anybody here got up when Josh said anybody that wants to... Josh uh, Fernandez was here and he got people up who were maybe thinking God was calling them into ministry. Remember that week? Some of you got up. <laughs> Imagine if you started some sort of ministry 
and 70% of the time of that ministry, for the rest of your life, you're in jail. Could you imagine? Well, that was the life of Paul. Most of the Bible that he wrote, the scriptures that he wrote, you know, he wrote a big chunk of the New Testament, was written from prison. How did he do that? How did he do that? Prayer. Can I just say something? This life that we are living and this current era that we are living in, the biggest lie that has been sold constantly is the lie that you can have a comfortable life. And, and I, I, it's sad to see people who have arranged all of their priorities and all of their lives in order to get into some sort of comfort, comfortable state. Um, then you have this lie that you can have comfort right now even if you haven't got enough money to pay for it. You know, you can take stuff on credit. You can get it on EMI. You can do this, you can do that, have it now. And your life will be sorted. Now, we're all smart people. Well, most of us are. I'm just joking. We're all smart people. We all know that that's a lie, but we still believe it. And we, we try and live our lives trying to get comfortable. When I get here, then I'll be comfortable. Well, I don't know about that. Life is hard. Life is difficult. Is it okay for me to, get to, to hope that I could get to a certain position? Yeah, sure, go for it. But don't think that when you get there that you're going to be comfortable. <laughs> I remember, man, I, so many times, it's so disappointing, actually. It's so disappointing when you work out that the things you thought would bring you comfort don't. Who knows that feeling? It's such a bummer. I, remember, I mean, when I was younger, I, I mean, this is a silly example, but when I was younger, um, <clears throat> all I wanted was a nice couch. Now I got a nice couch. But there came a point where that couch just wasn't doing it for me anymore, you know? It was such a bummer because I spent a lot of money on that couch, you know? We, it, uh, uh, this is kind of life. Yeah. Or, or there's, uh, there's, we, we, we think that when we get that relationship, you know, then we're going to be there. There's a lot of single people in our church. And I'm cool with that. I think that's great. Good for you. But don't think for a moment that you're going to be comfortable when you get married. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I mean, it's amazing. It's awesome. I love my wife. Like, I love Rachel so much. You know, I, I'm, I can't do life without her now. But comfort? Well, I don't know. Sometimes. Sometimes it's like World War III. Can I be honest with you? You know, it's all Rachel, it's not me. <laughs> you know, you can be living in this constant state of disappointment when you've made comfort your number one. You will be, I can guarantee it. There's one thing I can guarantee. If you think that you're going to get comfortable, you're never going to be comfortable. You have it temporarily. But then there'll be another fix. There'll be another need. There'll be another thing. Oh, it's, it's not doing it for anymore, for me anymore. And and this is the, this era, this life that we live in. If we feel, oh my gosh, it's time for finishing. If I can give you this, don't think that life is about comfort. Life is about relationship with God. This is why, if I can come back to Daniel, he's understood this. He was in a state of comfort. He had finally come into this place where, okay, I'm in the king's court, I'm getting all, I can live like a, you know, like royalty and all of that sort of stuff and it's about to be ripped away from him. He doesn't cry, he doesn't weep, he doesn't, he's like, prayer meeting. 
prayer meeting. Life is about relationship with God. And out of all of that things, though, that flows the, the springs of life. And your life will be directed by prayer as you're walking with Him. And when the discomfortable situation, or the uncomfortable, discomfortable, the uncomfortable, I don't know what's going on with my brain today, the uncomfortable moments come, you'll have a place to go to, which will be a source of comfort, which will be a source of hope, which will be a source of, of rejuvenation, where the well will, be get, will get filled up again, where you'll have a joy inside of you that even if you're in the midst of nowhere, if you're in, in, a, in a jail cell like Paul was, you'll have hope. You'll be able to write. You'll be able to still pray. You'll still have peace. And you won't have had to do anything for it except just pray. <laughs> Make prayer your first call. Make prayer your first call. This is what you have to do. Make prayer your first call. The second thing you have to do is pray together. You got some boys? You got some, who's got some boys to pray with? Some of the girls are like, yeah, I've got some boys. The boys can come pray with me. You need, you need, guys, you need guys around you to pray with. There's too many guys in this world, and I can just challenge this, there's too many guys in this world who think they're going to make it on their own. That's a lie. You're not. You need your friends. You need your friends. Because there's going to come moments where you don't have the answers. There's going to come moments where you don't know how to face the thing that you're trying to face and you need your, your friends to stand unemotionally for you and beside you. And if you're not sowing into those relationships now, your future is going to be difficult. Man, we need our buddies. And Daniel knew that. Daniel was working for one of the most amazing people, a king. He knew he had his crew. You've got to have your crew. You've got to have your crew. Who's your crew? Pray continually. Pray together. Girls, you don't, I don't have to tell you to do this. You already do it. <laughs> okay? You already do it, right? You know what I'm talking about. I get annoyed at the girls for that. I'm like, how come they just are like, it's so easy? We've got guys that's like herding cats, you know. <laughs> you can't herd them. Girls will come together, you know. Make prayer your first call. Pray together. Thirdly, completely trust in Jesus. When you, when you begin to pray, it's not the safe option. When you start to have a relationship with God, it's not the safe option. It's the scariest option you can take. But it's the most amazing. Get filled with the Holy Spirit and trust Him. So what happened to Daniel? Let me finish on this. Let's go back to Daniel. Put up Daniel chapter 2, verse 9. Oh, is it up there? Verse 19, yeah, you're right. My brain's not working today. It's up there? Okay, good. So God answers him first, verse 19. During the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. So Daniel's praying, he's praying, he's praying, he has a vision. Supernatural thing happens where he sees the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had. Now, he didn't have to do any tarot. He didn't have to do any, you know, calling up of the dead. He didn't have to do any sort of like, you know, I don't know, rubbing two sticks together or, or doing some sort of rain dance in the monsoon. I don't know. He didn't have to do any of that. He just prays and God speaks to him. It's the same for you. When you just pray, God's going to speak to you. You don't have to go and consult all of these ning nang magicians out there. Okay? You just need to pray. God's there. He wants to hear your voice. He wants you to be with him. And God reveals to Daniel the strategy in order for him to go forth and do what he needed to do. Now, this is important because a lot of you have jobs. You're all working for people. There's going to come a moment when your boss is going to be putting you on the chopping board, just like Nebuchadnezzar was putting Daniel on the chopping board, and you're going to need answers in that moment. 
What do you do in those moments? Pray. Get your friends together and pray. Do you understand? God will reveal to you what needs to be revealed in order for you, because there's going to come a point where your, your, your intellect, your smarts are not going to do it. I mean, your, your, see, Daniel's smarts, his, his background and who he was got him to where he was. But where God actually wanted Daniel to go, he couldn't do himself. And that, that, that was in the test that this was revealed, right? In the test of what Daniel was seeing and what he was up against. God answers him. And, and then, then let's look at the results. In, in chapter 2, verse 46, it says, Then when, when Daniel goes to the king and he tells him, he tells him uh, the entire dream. He, he, he reverts it all back to him. And then he gives the interpre interpretation for it. And it says this, Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate before Daniel and paid him honor and ordered that an offering and incense be presented to him. I just picture this. Can you just picture your boss doing this to you? <laughs> Could you imagine where the, the, where, the, where the answer you give your boss is so prophetic, it's from the king of kings himself, it's from the throne room of heaven, where your boss is like, Some of you ought to start praying. Some of you ought to start getting on your face before God and hearing His voice. He's going to train you. You want to be walking in the world as Daniel walked in the world, ten times better than everybody else? It's time to get on your knees. It's time to start seeking God. It's not in anything else but in God. You want to be the best at what you do? You want to be better than everybody else? You're not going to get it by competing. You're not. You're not going to get there by competing. What you're going to get it by is by prayer. See, God is going to begin to speak to you because you are called to be light. You are called to be salt. You are called to be different. You are called to actually stand out. That's what God does with his people. But we, we spend so much time doing all of the things and the activities of the world that we miss out on the thing that gives us everything, and that is the life source. That's Him. So, King Nebuchadnezzar, he, he, he fell prostrate. And then the king said to Daniel, imagine your boss saying this, Surely your God is the God of the gods and the Lord of kings and the revealer of mysteries. For you were able to reveal this mystery. Yeah, you can give God a clap. That's a bit of a crummy clap compared to what's going on here. But anyway, that's right. Next, next one, you'll get a better one. Then the king placed Daniel in a high position and lavished many gifts on him. In other words, his bonus that year was stinking awesome. He made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge of all its wise men. Moreover, at Daniel's request, the king appointed who? His boys. It, it says different names here because their names, these are their Babylonian names that they got changed. So Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. As chief ministers over the province of Babylon, while Daniel himself remained at the royal court. Anybody want to start praying? Anybody start, need some creativity? Anybody need some, some new ideas? Anyone need some strategies? Anybody need some stuff to happen in their world? Where does it happen? Get on your face before God. Pray all night. If that's what it takes, pray all night. Pray through the night. Gather your friends together. Pray, 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 pray. I can see this church. There's something that's going to happen as a result of this message. There are things that are going to shift in the atmosphere as people begin to get the idea of prayer. 
that it's not about all the sort of other things that everyone's made it be to be doing the right thing and all that. It's about getting the wisdom of God. See, last week we talked about Solomon. What did Solomon do when he got appointed king? The first thing he did was pray. Went up to the high place and he prayed. How do I do this, God? I don't know how to. He didn't have the wisdom. God rewards him with wisdom. Daniel prays. What does God do? God puts him in the highest position in the land. What's going to happen when you start to get this? Amen? C3 Mumbai is a church in the heart of India's commercial capital, where a diverse group of people brought together to worship God and to pass on the hope of salvation by grace that we freely received. For more information about C3 Mumbai, please visit our website c3mumbai.com or visit our Facebook page. Follow us on Instagram or tweet us on our handle at C3 Mumbai. Hey, it's Ryan here. If you enjoyed this message and you live in Mumbai, we would love to meet you in person. Why don't you come along 11.30 a.m. Studio 10, the famous studios in Mahalakshmi.